Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk of London's most notorious and often forgotten murder cases, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is a guided walk of the murder of West End prostitute Dutch Leia. And even though her brutal and violent death is often attributed to the infamous Soho Strangler, her actual killer has escaped justice for more than 80 years. But by re-examining the evidence, many aspects of which the police overlooked, maybe we can discover who killed Dutch Leia. Murder Mile contains vivid descriptions, which may not be suitable for those of a sensitive disposition as well as photos, videos and maps which accompany this series, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 4 The Mysterious Death of Dutch Leia Today, I'm standing on Old Compton Street in Soho W1, in the pumping heart of London's West End, wedged between infamous tourist traps like Piccadilly Circus to the south, Oxford Street to the west, Tottenham Court Road to the north, and Cambridge Circus to the east. At just 1,100 feet long and 30 feet wide, Old Compton Street consists of an odd mix of four-storey buildings all roughly identical in height and shape, but they are as uneven and discoloured as a toothy grin in a smashed mouth. Currently, Old Compton Street, like most of Soho, is desperately trying to scrub itself clean and erase its seedy image after decades of decline, having been a home to the destitute, the desperate, the debauched, the drugged and the drunk. The Soho of yesteryear was synonymous with one thing, sex. With some of its seedier streets awash with a swarm of sex shops, peep shows, nudie booths, clip joints, walk-ups and brothels. Amidst a dizzying haze of flashing neon signs, all proclaiming live sex, nude girls, and everyone's favourite euphemism, massage. Prostitution is a dangerous occupation, and Dutch Leia knew that, as it revolves around sex, money, and secrecy. As a lone female ushers a procession of drunk strangers into her bedroom, with the lights off, the doors locked, a series of loud noises, maybe a moan, maybe a yelp, maybe a scream, and all topped off by silence. As he dashes away into the night, his hat on, his collar up, looking furtive, with no names given, no numbers shared, and no paper trail to follow. Just a clandestine affair in exchange for untraceable cash. It's almost the perfect situation for a murder. And yet, the life of the Soho prostitute, Dutch Leia, is even more mysterious than her death. You see, Dutch Leia wasn't Dutch, and neither was her real name, Leia. She was born Constance May Hines in 1914 at the East Ham Hospital in East London, one of the most deprived areas in that era. Her father was unknown, she had no known siblings, and her mother, Kathleen Hines, was a career criminal, a convicted thief, a raging alcoholic, and a seasoned prostitute, who would later mysteriously change her name to Doreen Sempler. Constance had a rough upbringing, being poor, hungry, and unloved. She was often cared for by friends and neighbors during her mother's frequent periods of incarceration and intoxication. As they ran from place to place, With no sense of stability in her young, impressionable life, just a series of squalid lodgings and a slew of male strangers, all until the money ran out, the debts piled up, and once again, 
they'd both vanish. By the tender age of 14, Constance was alone and living on the streets, having ran away from her hovel of a home to escape the worst role model a young girl could ever have. But by then, the damage had been done. By the age of 18, she'd shacked up with a ragtag bag of unsavory characters and already had eight convictions for prostitution, all of which funded her rampant alcoholism. And by the age of 22, she'd been married twice. Once to a waiter from Margate called Robert Thomas Smith, and once, scandalously for this era, to a black entertainer called Jim Rich, with whom she had given birth to a baby girl, who she'd later give up for adoption. By 1936, the year of her death, aged 22 years old, Constance May Hines had been a prostitute for almost a decade. And like many London-born prostitutes, she'd adopted a street name that made her sound more exotic. She'd become Dutch Leia. She was short, slim, petite, with dark bobbed hair and dark brown eyes, all set within a sweet face which belied her horrifying upbringing. But Dutch Leia wasn't her only nom de plume, as in every shop, on every street, she was known by a variety of different names to disguise her deeds, including three different spellings of her surname, as well as Leia Hind, Leia Smith, Connie Smith, Connie May Hines, and Constance Smith. Having officially signed her marriage certificate to Robert Thomas Smith as May Constance Hines, and she was also affectionately known a stilts layer, on account of her love of wearing very high heels. And just like her mother before her, everywhere that Leia went, she hastily ran from shabby lodging to hideous hovel, leaving behind a trail of unpaid bills, overdue loans, and angry debtors. She'd spent her whole life running, but soon her running would stop. By the end of April 1936, she'd moved into a dilapidated second floor lodging at 66 Old Compton Street. Today, over 80 years on, although pristine white, the four-story building has hardly changed. But back then, it was run down, leaky and cheap. With a seamstress called Shaw's, who repaired ripped clothing on the first floor, a chemist shop called Fraser's, who sold cures, tonics and condoms on the ground floor, and the house was smack bang in the centre of Soho's clubs, pubs and red light district. Either the best or the worst place for a hooker with an alcohol problem. This was the thought of Stanley, Leia's new boyfriend of just four weeks. Born in Aldershot in 1912, Stanley Gordon King was a small-framed, sweet-natured, caring but easily duped 24-year-old semi-professional magician who performed conjuring tricks for a living in the local flea pits to a series of disinterested punters as an easy distraction between booze and boobs. Having met her in a bar just a few weeks prior, their courtship was brief, loving and passionate. But as much as Stanley was smitten with the still-married Leia, or Constance, or May, or whatever her name was that day, their relationship was built on a lie. As Leia had told Stanley that she was a waitress. Therefore, with Stanley out plying his trade from dusk till dawn, it must have seemed perfectly reasonable that Leia, as a waitress, would know a lot of men. It must have seemed perfectly reasonable that Leia, as a waitress, working shorter hours than Stanley, should have the only key to the second floor flat. And of course, it must have seemed perfectly reasonable that if Stanley wanted to enter his own flat, that he had to stand outside in the street and whistle up to the two windows of their bedroom and wait to be let in by Leia. Everyone knew about Dutch Leia, whether barmen, bouncers, club owners or landlords. 
everyone from Charing Cross Road to Shaftesbury Avenue, right through Cambridge Circus, everyone knew that when Stanley was out performing tricks, Leia was turning tricks for 10 shillings a pop. Everyone knew, except Stanley. No one knows where, when or how Stanley found out the truth. No one knows what was said. But what is known is that, being so smitten and only seeing the best in her, Stanley asked Leia to go straight and to quit the sex trade forever. She promised she would, but she never did. Leia was living a life which was all about lying and running. And not long after that, Leia was dead. On Friday the 8th of May 1936, at 3pm, Stanley left for work carrying his magician's bag. Not long afterwards, Leia headed east on Old Compton Street, down Moore Street and onto Cambridge Circus, outside of the Palace Theatre, which was her regular patch for picking up punters. By 11.30pm, she had already had sex with six men, and at ten shillings each, which is roughly £32 in today's money, she earned the equivalent of £192. But by midnight, she was short on cash, having squandered it all on gin, trinkets and gambling. And then she set off, down the slowly dying bustle of Shaftesbury Avenue, and Dutch Leia went looking for another punter. At a little after midnight, Emilio Plantino, a 26-year-old hall porter at the London Casino witnessed Leia walking west along Old Compton Street with a man who he describes as being a fair complexion, slim, clean-shaven, with light brown hair, brushed straight back, which was thinning on top, who wore a dark raincoat, but no hat. Roughly 30 minutes later, Lily Joyce and Nellie Few, a close personal friend of Leia's, saw her turn off Wardour Street, walk east along Old Compton Street and enter her flat at number 66. She was accompanied by a man, described as in his 30s, 5 foot 8, foreign looking, with long dark hair and a slouching gait. He was wearing a dark overcoat and a dirty cap. This is the last known sighting of Dutch Leia alive. At a little after 3.30 a.m. On the morning of Saturday the 9th of May, 1936, Stanley finished his four-hour shift as a conjurer at Billy's Club on Little Denmark Street and walked down Charing Cross Road and onto Old Compton Street, barely a five-minute walk. And not having his own key to the flat, Stanley stood in the street and whistled up to the second-floor windows, hoping to get his girlfriend's attention but there was no reply. Stanley would have to wait. At 8.45 a.m., Stanley tried again, but still there was no reply, except inside he could hear their six-week-old puppy whimpering, its childlike cries emanating from inside their bedroom. Growing concerned, Stanley started knocking on the communal door his loud hammering alerting the seamstress from Shaw's on the first floor, who arrived two hours prior and promptly let him in. Stanley raced up the stairwell to their flat and tried the door, but it too was locked. The harder he knocked, the more the puppy's cries grew pained, desperate and terrified. And yet still, his girlfriend didn't answer. With brute force, Stanley tried to break down the wooden door, but as a man of slight stature, more used to magic tricks than manual labour, the door barely budged. So he dashed across the street to a nearby cafe where his friend, James Adams, a builder by trade, was eating breakfast. Moments later, with a loud crack and a bang, the door broke wide open. Inside the flat was the terrified puppy. And so was Leia. 
Suddenly, the room was gripped with an eerie silence, as Stanley stood there, staring at his girlfriend, too scared to scream, too numb to run, and too terrified to turn away. Leia was lying across their double bed, partially dressed, with her stockings rolled down, her slip rocked up around her midriff, almost as if she was getting ready for her next punter, but no sex had taken place. Instead, around her neck, a thin copper wire from an electric light cord had been tied, having been used to brutally garrote her. The force of the strangulation, causing the length of her tongue to jut out of her mouth, like it was trying to escape the purple swelling of her screaming face. As the whites of her eyes ruptured, appearing almost black, as if they'd burst. Beside the bed was a rusty flat iron, which, being made of cast iron and weighing over two kilos, was as heavy as it was deadly, was found matted with dried blood, skin and hair having been used to repeatedly and brutally batter her over the head, rendering her senseless and splattering her blood of the walls, door and floor, as in her arms lay the terrified puppy. Constance May Hines, alias Dutch Leia, was 22 years old. A short investigation was conducted by Chief Inspector Sharp of Scotland Yard alongside the Home Office's chief pathologist and the pioneer of forensic science, Sir Bernard Spilsbury. As with four Soho prostitutes having been murdered in just a few short months, panic started to spread that there was a serial killer on the loose. Hundreds of witness statements were taken, three sets of fingerprints were discovered on the stone mantelpiece at 66 Old Compton Street, two being Stanley and Layers, and a third was never identified. And although the numerous men who had sex with Leia that night were asked to come forward, none of them ever did. Therefore, on the 9th of June, just four weeks later, the coroner, Mr. Ingleby Oddy, at Westminster Coroner's Court, concluded that the death of Constance May Hines was inconclusive. And the verdict? Willful murder by persons unknown. She was buried on Thursday the 21st of May 1936 under her married name of Constance May Smith. The day after her funeral, her mother Kathleen Hines, now renamed Doreen Sempler, who was living just a few streets away in Percy Street, was found slumped in her kitchen next to an open, unlit oven having tried to kill herself, being racked with grief at the death of her daughter. So, who are the suspects? Stanley King, her boyfriend, and the person who discovered the body was initially the police's prime suspect, but was ruled out owing to a cast iron alibi. One. Stanley did not have access to the flat as he didn't have his own key. Two, Stanley was confirmed by three witnesses, Emilio Plantino, Nelly Few and Lily Joyce, as not being either of the men who entered the flat with Leia shortly before her death. And three, he was working at Billy's Club on Little Denmark Street between 11.15pm and 3.30am and the pathologist recorded Leia's death as having occurred at 11.55 a.m. or a little after that. The police also interviewed her previous boyfriends, lovers and husbands, all of whom had alibis. Robert Thomas Smith, the Margate waiter, and her estranged husband had been out that night with friends in Kingston-upon-Thames, 12 and a half miles away. And as much as the tabloid journalists drooled over the detail that the police were seeking a coloured man in connection with the murder, Jim Rich, Leia's former boyfriend, father of her baby girl, and a black entertainer at the notorious Shim Sham Club on Wardour Street, was proven not to be her murderer, as at the time of her death, he was in prison. And as much as the tabloid press were less eager to actually report the facts, 
and were more fixated on attributing the violent death of another dead hooker to the infamous Soho Strangler, a maniac who had allegedly murdered three other prostitutes over the previous nine months, which is a ridiculous theory I shall happily debunk in a later episode. The investigation ground to a halt. And setting aside the suspects for a second, what was the motive? Why was Dutch Leia killed? There are three possibilities. Number one, rape. Not possible, as the murderer launched his brutal attack on Leia as she was sitting on the bed rolling down her stockings, and the pathologist confirmed that sex had not taken place. Two, robbery. Possible, as police found only two pence in her handbag, but given that she was short on cash before her final customer, why did her killer not steal anything else from her flat? And if this was a robbery, why did he strangle her, having already bashed her over the head with a flat iron? Number three, murder. Also possible, as owing to the way that the electrical flex was tied, crossed at the back of her neck and then brought forward, her murderer clearly wanted to look into her eyes as the life was drained from her body. But who'd want to murder her? Maybe someone who was angry. Maybe someone who was jealous. Maybe someone who was upset. Let's rethink the evidence. Number one. If the murder was premeditated, why didn't the killer bring a weapon with him? rather than using a flat iron and an electrical flex from Leia's bedside lamp, all of which were in the flat. Number two, if the murder was a spontaneous crime of passion, why, having brutally bashed her head in, did he then take the time to stage a robbery and lock both doors behind him, taking the only key? Number three, if the murderer didn't take the key and both doors were locked from the inside, how did he get out of the second floor flat, given that there was no drain pipe nor ladder to climb down? And number four, Home Office pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury put Leia's time of death as being 12.55 a.m. or shortly after that, but no later than 3 a.m. But can any of this evidence be trusted? Given that Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the notoriously arrogant father of forensic science, whose own evidence, it is alleged, led to the infamous Dr. Crippen being tried, convicted and executed for a crime that modern pathologists agree he did not commit. So who killed Dutch Leia? The police's original chief suspect was her boyfriend, Stanley Gordon King. His alibi was that he was performing magic tricks at Billy's Club on Little Denmark Street between 11.15pm and 3.30am, which is just a five-minute walk or a two-minute run from 66 Old Compton Street. And yet, how can anyone vouch for the whereabouts of one person in a busy nightclub on a Friday night for the full four hours that he was supposedly there? He also claimed that he didn't have a key. But why would a man who is rightfully suspicious that his new girlfriend is still a prostitute, given that she's a 10-year veteran of the sex trade who lives smack bang in the middle of Soho's notorious red light district, why would he allow there only to be one key to the flat that they both shared? Having discovered she'd broken her promise to quit the sex trade forever, was he angry? Was he jealous? Was he upset that his girlfriend was sleeping with other men, in his home, in his bed, on his sheets, the sickening smell of a strange man's fluid staining her lips? And having whistled up to Leia's window several times between 3.30am and 4.40am to be let in, an unusual act in its own right, and then trying again at 8.45am, what did Stanley do during those five hours that he was alone? Why are there only three sets of fingerprints at the scene? Layers, Stanley's and one other. And finally, why? 
If Stanley was at work, did the police remove from the murder scene and put into evidence something that they would later describe as a conjurer's apparatus? Was this apparatus always in the flat? Or having used it in a show and no longer needing it, did Stanley return home with it earlier that night? So who murdered Dutch Leia? Was it Stanley King, the jealous boyfriend? Was her cruel and violent murder just a conjurer's trick to make her disappear? And was his alibi simply a magician's sleight of hand? Unfortunately, that is something that we shall never know. As now, over 80 years on, the murder of Dutch Leia remains unsolved. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do rate us and subscribe to the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast on iTunes. And also like us and share us with your friends. And if you're in London, why not take part in my Murder Mile walk? It's a guided walk of Soho's most infamous murder cases, featuring 12 murderers across 15 locations, totaling 50 mysterious deaths, all in just under two hours. Tickets are available via my website, murdermiletours.com. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the music written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. The next episode is entitled The Bombing of the Admiral Duncan.